welcome to another sermon from the Lewis Church of Christ. And now, here's Adam. Your toes here at the crossing. Always shaking things up a little bit. Love matters. What you do this week matters. We started our July sermon series uh, last week. We called it Playing for Keeps. We understood that playing for keeps is an idea that we're always playing to win, right? And when we play that way, everything we do, every shot we take, every effort we make, the stakes are higher. We're talking about eternal things and, and the landscape of eternity. And so everything we do each week matters. How many of you, last week we talked about, about an, you know, making the most of our time. How many of you have memorized the memory verse? Where are my kids? I'll bring them up here and put you all to shame. Psalm 90, 12, say it with me. Teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. I made it short on purpose. Like, come on. We got to write the Word of God on our hearts, guys. Let's go with this, right? And this is a prayer that Moses prayed. It's a prayer that reminds us how important each moment, each day, each week, each month, each year is. And we want to number our days. We want to make the most of the time that we have. We understand uh, that the most significant gifts that we can give, especially to the next generation, is the gifts we can give them over time. And so I, really the next few Sundays that we're together, I want to spend thinking about what are those most significant things that we can give to our kids over time. And I think the best place to start is love. Love is, is, is the best place to start. A lot of things, if you think about our world, a lot of things wouldn't make sense without love. We wouldn't pass a love bucket, for one, here at the crossing. It might be a like bucket. We would have missed out on shows like The Love Boat. Who can exist without The Love Boat? I mean, seriously. I don't know how too many people would have felt about some redhead named Lucy, and our budgets would be way better midway through February if it weren't through, for love if love were taken out of the equation. And then just think about music for a moment. If we were to take love out of the equation, music would be vacant of some of the greatest artists, the great most gifted people, and some of the greatest song titles ever created. Who can, I mean, really, how can we go on without love in an elevator? How can we possibly get through our days without love potion number nine? Or my personal, my personal favorite, Hello. I love you. Won't you tell me your name? You older generation had some weird, weird musicians. I'm just, I'm just, I'm not saying it's changed. It's the same now. Oh my goodness gracious. But let's face it, our world would not be such a great place if it weren't for love. Love may be the best idea that was ever created. And you know who invented this? You originated this idea of love? God did. Love is a God idea, and I know that one God idea is better than 10,000 good ideas. And love is, is a God idea. And I think most of us would agree that love, it's, a, it's, it's really important, it's a great idea, but sometimes, I don't know, sometimes we, we kind of get out of whack and, and we, we, we lose sight of things and we get confused or distracted and our, our top 10 list gets a little jumbled about what matters most. Have you, you ever been there? We just need a little reboot sometimes. One of the things that I really enjoy about the Bible is that I realize, like Solomon says, there's nothing new. Like when we get things out of whack, we're not the first people to have that happen to us. And so we can, we can learn from, from people who have gone before us, like, like the Pharisees. Do you remember the Pharisees? The, the Pharisees, well, I'm going to tell you about them in case you don't remember. I'm just going to fill you in, just catch you up, all right? Juliet, I love that you sit up front. At least you're paying attention. The Pharisees, they were the religious leaders of the day, the religious people. They, were, they believed in God. They did all they could to learn about what mattered most, what they thought mattered most to God, what was important to him, and, and that's the way they rolled. No one prayed harder or longer. Uh, no one worked harder at keeping the rules than the Pharisees. No one showed up more consistently to the temple than the Pharisees did. No one studied the scriptures more diligently than the Pharisees did, but while they were doing all of this, the, the, what they thought was the most important things to God, right? While they were doing all these important things, they missed what was most important. They missed it. And I know 
You and I have felt that same way where we're, we're doing and doing and doing and we feel like that we're just missing the mark, that we're spinning our wheels, that just things are not going right. Have you been there, right? And so we're there and we can learn from the Pharisees. Luckily, Jesus kind of helps them out in the scenario in the scriptures. And so we can learn from what Jesus is helping them out and so he helps us out the same way. And so here's Jesus. He's having a conversation with another religious group called the Sadducees. It's in Matthew chapter 22. And he's talking to them, and they're talking about the resurrection. They're talking about resurrection in general. The Sadducees didn't believe in, in resurrection. And like any religious group or, or any opposition to Jesus in his day, they were all trying to trip him up, catch him in a lie, you know, get him to say something that didn't add up. And like every time it happened, Jesus was baffling them with his answers to the point that at the end of their conversation, the Sadducees, well, they were just quiet. They had nothing left to say. And that's where we pick up in Matthew 22, verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. We're going to give it a shot. We'll have a go at this guy. One of them, a lawyer, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. We're going to test God, because that's a, always a wise idea. That was sarcastic. It's not a wise idea. Don't test God. Anyway, so he says, he says teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one's just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Did you hear what he said? Did you hear what Jesus said? He said, love matters. Love matters. Loving God matters. Loving yourself matters. Loving people matters. In fact, nothing else matters if love is left out of the equation. Everything, everything you're teaching, everything you're proclaiming, all the stuff you're studying, it all hinges on love. But love is, love is just love, right? Someone saying it's a secondhand emotion. Un love is just love until you put it over time. When you put love over time, something amazing happens. When you, when you show love over time, something it, it accomplishes something that's so powerful. Love over time in someone's life, invested in people, invested in young people, gives them value. It gives them worth. They understand that they matter because we're loving them not one time, but over time. And before you get all upset about, you know, well, it's not all about love. Like, there's other things that's important. Because I know there's some of you out here saying this. You've said it before. I've said it. There's other stuff than love. Let's never forget who said it. Jesus said that love is the most important thing. God of the universe in the flesh on earth said love is, is what matters most. Right? Jesus said it. The one who created love, the one who created us, the one who created everything said that love is what matters most. So let's be careful that we never minimize what Jesus maximized. Okay? Love matters. And if you know the gospel story, you know that God used time to prove His love for us. You and I as adults know that we matter because God proves over time that we matter, right? Right? We know that God thinks so highly of us because He's shown it and He's proved it over long, long, long periods of time. The entirety of Scripture, the whole Bible, is a story about God pursuing a relationship with us. The whole thing. Why would He do that? Because He loves us. Regardless of our behavior, Regardless of our, our performance, regardless of our mess, God continually over time shows up. And finally, He sent His Son. He said, you know what, they're still not getting it. I've got to get down there. And He sent His Son, Jesus, right? He, Jesus, God comes to earth. Why would He do that? To walk with us. To be, to be physically present with us. That we might walk with Him and talk with Him and touch Him and know Him. God sends His Son and He ultimately says to every single person to ever exist the same message, you're worth dying for. That's how I feel about you. And He proves it over time. Now, 
that's something that's pretty hard for us to wrap our minds around sometimes, right? Imagine how abstract a thought that is for young people. To really fully grasp that. And that's why kids need you. Adults and parents alike have a unique position to teach them and to show them the love of God. The love that God has for them, it's our opportunity, it's our responsibility to teach them and show them that. We need, we, kids need adults who are going to step up and who are going to play for keeps and major in the things that matter most and who are going to love them in a way that convinces them that they're worth something. The way you love kids when they're kids can dramatically affect their futures. Every study shows it. What you do for kids is more important than what you do for adults. Yes, I said it. What you do for kids is more important than what you do for for adults. Last week we used the word invest. We want to invest in the next generation. We want, to, we want to make the most of our time and wisely use our time to pour into the next generation. Most research suggests that when it comes to love, the younger the recipient, the more powerful the impact. To putting it in investing terms, the sooner you start paying in, the greater the return later in life. And so the time you spend every week with a child, playing, reading, talking, laughing, right? All of these things, loving them, it matters. The time you spend doing those things are worth it because they're worth it. Are you getting this? Love, <laughs> love matters. The fact is, our, our, our kids, for our kids to grow up and know that they're worth it, you and I have to look for opportunities, look for ways to prove it over time. Kids will test you. If you don't know that, you've not hung out with too many of them. But here's what us adults do. We know that we love them. We tell them that we love them. And so we believe that, that they should just understand that we love them. Right? And here's what kids are thinking. You keep telling me you love me. Prove it. Prove it. Prove that you love me. Right? And that may seem unfair, but think about the world we live in and that we're growing up in, that our kids are growing up and They're getting all these mixed signals and all these mixed things about, about love and approval. And oftentimes they, they, they're in situations and find experiences that, 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 that their, their, their worth and their value is dependent upon their performance. It's dependent upon their, their performance. What kids need, what teens need, is someone who will love them like God does. You know how, lo how, lo how God loves? He loves consistently. God loves intimately. God loves unconditionally. God loves consistently. God loves intimately. And God loves everyone unconditionally. And so to that end, I just want to share with you three ideas that, that you can put into this week that you love your kids this week, that you can prove to them they're valuable and love them like God does. And maybe it's better put as a challenge. Guys love challenges, right? I, I know you guys love challenges. Here's the deal, guys. I'm challenging you. Prove it. Spend your time this week and in the weeks to come proving to those kids who matter most in your lives that you love them and that they are worth it. Here's three ideas. The first one is, seems very simple. It's be present. Be present. You know what that means? It means show up consistently. It seems like it's such a, such a simple thing to be present, but I feel like we need, to, we need to verbalize it. There's a difference between being in a room and being present. Give your full attention. Get down on the floor. Turn everything off. Go sit outside under the tree with them. Stand by the water's edge and let your, your feet sink into the sand with them. You know what that takes? Time for that to happen. Unless you're heavier and it goes faster. Just saying. But we live in a world like this. I'm not the first to say it. That's not an original thought, but it needs to be. I live in a world like this. The emails, the texts, the Instagrams, the Twitter, the Facebook, all of that can wait because you are giving worth to a child. 
And they'll test you in this too because, you know, they want to see if you're for real. If you do it that one time, that's great. But being consistent, being present, showing up like God would show up is over time. They want to know that you care enough, that, that you love them enough, that, and they're not going to believe you if you don't love them enough to, well, to like them enough to hang out with them for a little bit of time. And so be present with them. A second thing, we said God loves intimately. Would you, would you get to know your kids? Knowing teenagers and knowing kids is not like knowing the Pythagorean theorem where you learn it one time and it's just always going to be that way. You want proof of evolution? It's kids. They're evolving into these creatures that we've never seen before. I'm joking. Right? Sort of. But our kids are always changing. They're always growing. They're evolving in, 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 their, in their maturity. And in order to know them, you know what you have to do? You've got to spend some time. You've got you to give some space. You've got to create spaces in your week to know that. To listen to them. To listen to what they're saying, what they're not saying. To pay attention enough to know, to care enough to discover how they're really wired and, and who they really are. If you want to prove to a kid or teenager you really care about them, we have to get into this practice of, of consistently and constantly getting to know them. And can I give you just an extra thought when it comes to knowing your kids? You know when you really know your children or the kids you're involved with? We can give them rules that make sense. The Bible says to dads specifically, don't exasperate your kids. Don't, don't put these these ridiculous expectations on them. And what we tend to do is we expect them to do something, but we never tell them about that. Kids need rules, and when you know who they are, we can really create the rules to, to fit who they are and help them to succeed rather than to force them to uh, obey or, or rebel and disobey. Kids need boundaries and structure, and so would you have them? The people thrive within, within structure and, and with rules in place. They know what's expected, and it, and it proves that you care enough to protect them and to give them structure because it pays off in the future. That's what God did. Think about it. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to understand that God was in the business of giving rules. I've never counted each one specifically, but I read there's over 600 rules. It says if God were saying... The one who created us, the one who understands perfectly how we're wired is saying that one of the best ways I can show up and prove that I love you is to tell you over and over, over thousands of years, time and time again, don't do that. Don't touch that. You're going to want to wash that before you eat it. Right? Don't hang out with them. That's what God did. It's not the only way he proved his love, but, but rules is a way to prove that you care and the best way to give rules is to know the people, the kids that you're giving them to. One last thing. Prove to your kids that they're worth it by never running away. God never runs away, does he? That's unconditional love. Never run away. There's going to come a time in, in the kids' lives that, that you're involved with, your own children, that, that things are going to get messy. And it might be that they get sick, or it might be that they get hurt or sad emotionally, uh, struggling with things. It might be that they're just experiencing natural uh, consequences to some decisions they've made. And none of these are, 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 are circumstances that you've created and, and you, there's nothing you can do about them even though you may want to. But what I know is, is how you respond in these situations are going to forever impact your relationship with them. And how you respond in these situations is going to forever affect the way that they respond when these situations happen again. Love faithfully shows up and faithfully stays close in spite of their behavior or their performance. You know, we were talking about rules just a moment ago, and if, if you look, it's very easy in the Old Testament to see how God related to the, to the Israelites. He showed up, He gave them rules, and they broke them. Over and over. I'm talking about over time. Over and over and over and over again. The thing about broken rules is they're the same now as they were then. A broken rule is, is, it creates a unique opportunity to prove love. Think about it. We give them rules and, and they break them, which they do, and we show up anyway. And when we do that, we communicate unconditional love. That's what God did. He gave us rules, we break them, and He shows up anyway. 
It doesn't mean there's not going to be consequences. It doesn't mean there's not going to be time for instruction and correction. We want them to make wise choices in the future, right? But what it does mean is we're never going to punish them relationally. We're never going to check out. We're never going to disengage. We're never going to just, I'm sorry, deal with it on your own. Regardless of what they've done, you still have the opportunity to prove that you're not going anywhere because you know what? You matter. You matter enough for me to stick around. You, you, you can prove that you're committed to them regardless of the mess, regardless of how difficult or inconvenient it might be, that you're going to stick with them through it all. And so I challenge you to prove this week that you love your kids. To be present, which is loving them consistently. To really get to know and understand who they are, which is loving them intimately. And to stick by them no matter what their performance or behavior is, and to never run away is to love them unconditionally. And I know that all those three things, none of them can happen this week alone. It's over time. It's the way God does it. Probably the best way we can do it. Because see, certain things can only be understood over time. And God knew that. And so the one who is able to do everything immediately decide to prove his love for us just that way. Over, over time. And that's how we can do it. Remember, we're playing for keeps. So what you do this week matters because what you do this week is connected to next week, is connected to the following week, and so on and so forth. And it's cumulative. We're building these things up and we're, we're giving our kids value. One of my favorite pictures of Jesus in the Scripture is when he really puts on display how much kids matter. Uh, a bunch of parents were wisely bringing their kids to Jesus. That's a great lesson there. That's a whole other sermon. Um, we're bringing their kids to Jesus for, for him to bless them, and, and the disciples started shooing them away. Hey, go stop. Stop, stop, stop. He doesn't have time for this. He doesn't have time for this. Remember that story? And Jesus says, whoa. The Bible says, he, he used the word, he got indignant. He was mad as fire, right? He got mad at them. He said, whoa, let the little children come to me. You know this one, right? The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, which is so cool. It's such a great lesson. But then he does something so awesome. The God of the universe holds them in his arms. He hugs them. He loves them. And isn't that the picture we want our kids to know about the God that we're trying to bring them to? Isn't that the perfect picture of a God who is present and who is intimate and who is unconditionally loving? Kids matter. Love matters. And love shown consistently, intimately, and unconditionally to a young person over time proves how valuable they are. Not just how valuable they are to you but it proves to them how valuable they are to their Heavenly Father. Love over time accomplishes incredible. So my challenge for you this week, prove it. This has been a presentation of the Lewis Church of Christ. We are located at 15183 Coastal Highway, Milton, Delaware, three miles north of Lewis on Highway 1. Our service times are 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. every Sunday morning.